Hello, fellow Rebel Capitals. Hope you're well. I've got my good buddy here, Professor Steve Keen, who is actually the Rebel Economist. Remember, Steve, I think last time we spoke, you were in a black leather jacket. And we said, <laughs> okay, the, the Rebel Economist is here to talk to the Rebel Capitalist. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, I've grown. I've grown out of the uh, black. I've uh, grown. I've expanded out of the uh, leather jacket. <laughs> Hopefully, um, I'm trying to knock off the weight I've gained over the last uh, god six years. So um, maybe I'll get it back on again by next year sometime. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That'll be your objective: is to get uh, back in shape for the good old leather jacket. So um, um, you had a back and forth the other day with. Uh, What's the guy's name? The guy that wrote the the black. I don't know. Swan. Some some obscure. Oh, that's right, him. Yeah, uh, Nassim Taleb. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but it goes back to kind of the hot topic of of the day, which is this debt crisis, this sovereign yeah. debt crisis that everyone's saying that the United States is headed toward. But mm -hmm. uh, you've got a, a a very interesting view on this, and so I'd like you to hopefully communicate your view. You can give us the Reader's Digest version, and then I'd like cool. to dissect that a bit and then maybe talk about more macro stuff. Okay, okay, let's roll. Yeah, so, so, so yeah, if you could tell us your view on the government debt crisis or that narrative. Okay. Well, okay, there isn't one in any country that doesn't have to borrow in another country's currency, period. And the reason is that, uh, and, and this is something which goes right back to the why I am a rebel economist, because... The, uh, the basic stuff people get taught in textbooks about money is to use a technical term, total bullshit. Okay, uh, right. to, to elaborate on that, uh, money is a creature of double entry bookkeeping. And right. If you don't look at it from a double entry bookkeeping point of view, you're not going to understand it. So long story short, I developed a software package to enable that to be done called Minsky. And I do all my mathematical modeling and that these days. And if you lay out, um, the, the banking sector, then the fundamental thing about double entry bookkeeping is you have to classify accounts as being either assets or liabilities, and right. the gap between the two is your equity. Okay. Right. So, and then we, if you, you then look at the major actors in a capitalist economy from a monetary point of view, it's the banks, okay, it's the non bank private sector, yep. the central bank, and then the treasury. Those are your four components you have to look at. And I'll start at the simplest level, which is just talking about how to how do banks themselves create money. And this is something which not only do the textbooks teach you something which is garbage, uh, the central banks came out in starting in 2014 and told what the real situation is. And this is something which my rebel economist side of the profession has been arguing for pretty close to 100 years. Uh, actually longer, you can take it back to Schumpeter in the 19, 1910s. Uh, but saying, look, banks create money just by double entry bookkeeping. They, they, there's got to be a debt contract, of course, between the borrower and the bank. But as long as the borrower agrees to the contract, the bank says, we're going to put X dollars in your deposit account, which is your asset and our liability. So long as you agree that we're going to put exactly the same number in your loan account, which is our asset and your liability. Right. So banks create money by creating debt. And that's something which is simple, bleedingly simple to show. And mainstream economists don't understand it and don't want to understand it. Could um, I, and I think you're yeah, talking so you about the, the 2014 yeah. paper from the BOE? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's one I'm, I'm well aware of. And is it fair to say your view or, or the big divide, the line in the sand, is most economists, and I would argue most people, believe that yeah. banks simply lend money. Uh, lend where deposits. you believe, people, people, yeah, they where you believe money. banks create yeah. money. So yeah, uh, to exactly. put this in simple term, I did a video on this the other day, Steve. I just oh, used good. two pens. So uh, to put it in, in terms that everyone can understand, what most people believe, and this is 99% of quote-unquote experts as well. Yeah. I, I've been debating them on Twitter nonstop. And they believe that if I have one pen, then I can lend out one pen. But if I have mm. two pens, now I have more pens, therefore I can lend out more pens. Mm. That would be an example of people thinking banks lend. Therefore, the more pens they have, or the more bank reserves they have, or whatever they have, uh, yeah. this means they can actually lend more. There's some sort of constraint. Mm. 
Or what you say exactly. is, no, 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 that, that's not true. If banks create money through the process of lending, then there doesn't need to be anything there to begin with because they, when they create a loan, it's simply a, dep- a commercial bank deposit liability. And the yeah. offsetting asset is the loan which they just created. So exactly, w- is that a fair assessment of your view? That's a fair assessment, and it's a okay. fair assessment of the central what the central banks came out and said in 2014. Also, the Bundesbank, of all of all banks, the Bundesbank breaking with orthodoxy and saying, "Look, banks create money simply by the act of double entry bookkeeping." And uh, but as you say, that what the mainstream believes, and they teach this in their textbooks, they give idiots like, and pardon me, I'm going to be totally blunt about this. No, no, like, go for it, go for it. Idiot, idiots like Ben Bernanke, a Nobel Prize, for continuing to spout this nonsense. Uh, that they say, well, banks can only lend out what they've got in reserves, and then they they then say there's then a chain reaction process where that uh, if you like the, the, the conventional story, and this is what everybody will think is the real world. Not everybody. There will be some intelligent, or I'm going to, I won't be totally insulting, some informed people <laughs> tuning in, okay? Um, they believe that the, the depositor goes into the bank with $100 in cash, right. whacks that in the bank, and the bank says, thanks very much. We're going to put that in the vault, and here's a little receipt to you, which we call your deposit account. We're going to, go to write the number 100 against that. You can go away now. And then the bank goes back to the vault and says, oh, here comes a bloke who wants a loan. Uh, we're going to hang on to $10 of that and give him 90 bucks in cash, and he can walk out the door, and he walks out the door and goes to another bank and drops that 90 bucks in that bank. The bank does the same story, writes the receipt, his 90 bucks that's now in your account. We've now got 90. Julie comes in and wants another loan. Oh, we'll give you 81 and hang on to nine. And by that process, they think that if there's a – what they call a reserve requirement or required reserve ratio of 10 percent and that initial deposit of 100 after a whole series of chain reactions like that ends up creating a thousand dollars of money 900 of which of loans and 100 dollars which of cash right and people say that's terrible the bank is lending out money it hasn't got that's fraction reserve banking we should ban it let's all become austrians and and refuse to let banks do this blah 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 blah, blah. it's not what they do at all uh, and, and, and this is what's so frustrating, you can tell the people like me to hear this crap being regurgitated, but it's not people's fault. It's, uh, it, it's having a profession which says to them, yeah, look, you're right. There's the sun. It rises and it sets. Therefore, the earth is the centre of the universe. And what you're right. observing is the sun rotating around us. You say, come along, Copernicus, come along. hang on a second. It's not the earth rotating around the sun, it's us spinning on our axis. And, mm. and therefore we see the sun go over the sky. Now we still say sunrise and sunset, but only lunatics, or should I call that sunatics? <laughs> yeah, Luna, there you go. <laughs> they're, the, they're the only ones who believe that the earth is actually the center of the earth. You know, flat earthers are gonna come out and say that nonsense, but you have gotta be a flat earther to believe it. But the only reason that's happened is because the astronomers woke up around 1500 courtesy of Copernicus and Galileo and Tycho Brahe and, and Newton ultimately and then and Kepler and then worked out what's actually going on. And we now still use the phraseology from Ptolemy 2,000 years ago. But, mm. you know, you've, you've got to be a fool to believe the sun orbits the earth now. Trouble is that's precisely the same nonsense is believed by the banking, by the public, because that's what they can read in any economics textbook. I think it's also because it intuitively makes sense, Steve. I spoke well, to, J- yeah. to Jeff Snyder yesterday, and I told him a story about a spaces that I did the other day on Twitter where I invited people to debate with me, you know, just in a friendly, respectful manner. And I spoke Not to like one I gentleman. Am. Yeah, I spoke to one gentleman who, very intelligent guy, but I was trying to kind of explain my view and, and, and my argument there is that just in normal times where risk is normal, that bank reserves really don't impact uh, the bank's ability to lend at all. And I said, just tell me what a bank can do with X amount of reserves that they can't do with Y amount of reserves, assuming that risk is constant. Right? Um, and he almost wouldn't entertain the question because he thought it was so stupid. And, yeah. and it, 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 because for him, it's like, George, how, how can you even say something that's so simplistic that 
you know, it's obvious that if a bank has more assets, if the bank has more money, they can lend more money. And to him, it that was so obvious that it wasn't even worth doing any research to figure out if that may or may not be true. So I think that's part of the problem. Yeah. That it comes so intuitive, it is so intuitive for people that they never, ever, ever take the time to question it because everyone else is saying the exact same thing. And it's just, hey, the, the, why should I even research this? Because it's just so basic. Everyone knows that this is the way it works. Yeah, and that's exactly the same story about the sun orbiting the earth. Yeah, you know? yeah. Okay, exactly the same thing. So the only way you break out of it is your experts look at things and find anomalies that don't fit that pattern. So I go back to the astronomical example. The reason Galileo was so important, apart from his sheer genius, was that he invented the telescope. And then with the telescope, you could see this, the moon at 30 times the resolution you could see with the naked eye. And it was then obvious there were craters there. Now, one part of the Ptolemaic theory, which comes from Aristotle, is that the heavens are perfect. Nothing ever changes in the perfect. There's perfectly heavenly. We call them heavenly bodies. They were spheres, perfect spheres. And they didn't intersect with each other, and they all orbited the Earth. Only when you look through the telescope, you saw craters on the moon, which are pretty obvious signs of past collisions, and you saw moons orbiting Jupiter. And that suddenly could not be fit and fitted inside the conventional paradigm. And it's one, wonderful actually to read Galileo because uh, believe me, I know the frustration he feels. I really do. Because he wrote to Kepler at one stage and said, tell me, my dear Kepler, what are we to do with these so-called learned gentlemen from the universities who refuse with the perspicacity of an asp? In other words, somebody's already, a snake that's already eaten and won't bother eating anything else. Refuse to look down the telescope. They refuse to look and see. Now, thank God, ultimately, not thank God, thank people who don't believe in God. Uh, ultimately, people started looking down the telescope and saw, yes, well, actually, there are craters there. And yes, there are moons orbiting Jupiter. And there's no way we can make either of those phenomena fit inside the idea of the Earth as the center of the universe and everything orbiting around it and heavens being perfect, et cetera, et cetera. So, bang, that was the beginning of the scientific revolution. Now, with economics, it's a similar thing. And like you've got this, what it's, as you say, it sounds plausible. You deposit your money in the bank, bank lends it out to somebody else. Okay? And that's, and that, if you, if you have that, it's just like, you know, sun rises in the east, sets in the west, end of story. Don't you dare bother me with this crazy technical stuff you're talking about. Uh, you know, I don't need to do that telescope to know how the, how the sun orbits the earth. Um, so with the, with the monetary thing, the, if I give an example that I hope makes a bit more sense to people, the only way that conventional story works is if all loans are in cash. Right. I'll go through the I was just going to get to this. Yeah. Okay. So I mean, you, know, you George walks up to the bank, slaps a hundred dollars in notes down on the table. Bank puts it in the vault. You walk out with the receipt saying the bank owes you a hundred. Now, if somebody, you know, I come in, Steve comes in to borrow, and the bank says, "Oh, we've got nine. We can lend you 90. Now, if they try to write the number 90 on my deposit account and then at the same time reduce their reserves by 90, okay, then in accounting terms, they're putting minus 90 against the reserves and plus 90 against the, uh, the, the deposits, which is the assets go down and the liabilities go up. So that doesn't work. The only way they can give me that loan and actually balances is they have reserves go down by 90 and loans go up by 90. Now, that means that on the asset side, they've done an asset swap, reserves down by 90, loans up by 90, but what about me? How do I actually get the cash? Literally, the only way I can is I get the cash in my hand and I walk out the door with 90 bucks in cash, and then I go and repeat the process. Now, I'd like people to ask themselves, when is the last time you got a loan in cash? Yeah. Right. Okay. So th that's something, hang on, that doesn't work. So the only way it works is if the bank writes the number 90 in the loan account and writes the number 90 in your deposit account at the same time. And that way, yes, you've created loans and you've created deposits at the same time. You simply cannot give an electronically based loan by lending out reserves. So that's my little telescope 
craters on the moon analogy. If you believe in fractional reserve banking, then you believe that all loans are in cash. You're right, right. And I think that's a big mental step for people as well because they see money as a green piece of paper or yeah. as a gold coin or, or something physical or, or like a yeah. pen. You know, it's funny you use the example of the of the solar system because I always say in my videos, that the, the people believe the Fed is at the center of the monetary universe yeah, or the yeah, solar system. Yeah. And I always say it, it's not the Fed, uh, it's the banks. The banks are at the center of the monetary solar system and the Fed just simply revolves around the banks themselves. Um, what I'd like to get your view on, Steve, uh, maybe this is a little bit off topic, but I, I think you may find this interesting. It's something that I kind of uh, wrestle with from time to time. It's from a standpoint of consumer price inflation, what is the difference between a money supply that is lent into existence and a money supply that is simply, let's just say printed, right? So if we had a pie chart, <clears throat> excuse me, of 100% of the money supply within a society, and let's say that 100% of that pie chart was green pieces of paper. Yeah. So when a bank is, is is lending you money, they're lending you a green piece of paper, so that did not impact M2 money supply. And when you pay that loan back, it didn't decrease M2 money supply. It's just, it's, it's always a constant there. Compared to a society where the currency units, 100% of them, were lent into existence. Therefore, if a bank does create a loan, it creates more currency units, but if that loan is paid off, it decreases the amount of currency units. Would the society that has more of the currency units lent into existence be less um, susceptible to consumer price inflation? Because if the demand for lending goes down, the supply of currency units can also go down as well. Whereas if we have all pieces of paper, if demand for those currency units goes down, then all of a sudden you have a demand supply imbalance that's a very complicated scenario sorry to just um, throw that one on you it's just something okay. that I, I, I mentally yeah wrestle I, with. I i i think um my way of approaching that is to say that there are two ways you create money in a monetary economy the banks create money by lending out more than they get back in repayments yeah the government creates money by spending more than it gets back in taxation those are the two methods and if when you look at the aggregate level, how much the total money supply is created by credit money versus how much is created by fiat money, the answer is, in fact, far too much is created by private banks by credit money. Okay. And that's of the order. I mean, it's it's very hard to, um, to specify precisely for a number of technical reasons, which I'm happy to discuss about why the amount of government money creation is not totally under government control. Um, but but the the basic story is about ninety percent of our money is created by private banks, and only about roughly of the order of ten percent uh, is created by the government. And you'll see you'll see people like Positive Money saying ninety seven percent is created by uh, the private banks and three percent by the government. I think that's confusing little green pieces of paper with the entire money supply because if you look at the amount of money that is actually in physical form, notes or coins, it's of the order of about 3% of, uh, of the total money supply. The other 97% is bank accounts. But right. when you look at the bank accounts, there's two ways that money, electronic money, can be deposited into bank accounts. One is that the you take out a loan and the government, the bank records you owe a liability to them while putting precise the same amount of money in your deposit account. That's how credit money is created. Or your deposit accounts can go up because the government spends more money into the economy than it taxes out. Okay. And that's how fiat money is created. Now, that gets complicated by the fact that banks have the right, which I do not believe they should have completely, they have the right to sell any bonds they buy off the, off the government. And then when they sell those bonds, that the way people buy those bonds is by reducing their deposit accounts and getting in return the bonds that the bank government is selling you. That destroys government created money. And I don't think that they should have the complete right to do that. I think it's a mistake 
about how we manage the system. But those, so there's, there's the, the, the fundamental answer is we let far too much of our money supply be created by private banks and not enough by the government, which of course is the reverse of what most people think. Let me try to communicate that to the audience in a, a different way and, and see if I'm still capturing the spirit of, of what you're saying. Hopefully I'm not distorting it uh, to where it's uh, what I'm saying is inaccurate based on uh, mm -hmm. what your view is. When uh, w the way I look at it, Steve, is let's just exclude the Fed for a minute and let's just look yeah. at the Treasury and the, 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 the non-bank entities in society. Uh, if Janet Yellen is coming out and selling a Treasury, uh, most likely someone's going to pay for that Treasury with savings or M2. And what's going to happen is, is you've got an asset swap where Janet Yellen is going to take that uh, or the bank is going to take their savings account balance down, let's say from a thousand down to zero because they're buying a thousand dollars with the treasuries. But the asset side of their balance sheet, the non-bank entity, isn't going to change. It's just the composition is going to change because they had a thousand dollars in savings and now they have a thousand dollars of treasuries, which is you know kind of like a cash equivalent. But then what Janet Yellen does, you know, through the process of the reserves going to the TGA and then spending it, you know, then the reserves going back into the banking system. And then Janet Yellen just, let's just say she sends out a stimulus check. Um, and then that the, the person takes the stimulus check and then deposits it in their bank account. So M2 money supply goes back up to a point where it was before. But what has changed is the aggregate balance sheet for society has actually increased. Because although M2 is the same, now we have a treasury plus M2, where at the beginning, we just had M2. So from that standpoint, the government has, by deficit spending, has increased the aggregate balance sheet for the non-bank entities in society. Is that, does that reflect what your view is accurately? Just said in a different yeah. way. He gets it slightly wrong because it's actually the treasury that does that. Um, uh, but the, the treasury that the, does that create the treasury. The treasury is the entity that creates the bonds that are then sold on. Um, oh, so did I say, I, that's what I meant. I, yeah, I, yeah, 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 yeah. You said the central bank. Um, so yeah, but yes, it is fundamentally that the treasury can create a liability for its. And that, actually, it even creates a negative equity for itself, which creates positive equity for the non-bank sector. This is the sort of thing which, you know, I, I invented the software package called Minsky deliberately to enable me to understand how money works. That's like my version of the telescope. Yeah. And it taught me things that I, actually I got things wrong before I built Minsky. I thought that uh, government money creation depended upon, and this is a bit like what you were arguing to some extent, gov depended upon the extent to which the Fed bought government bonds. Mm. Okay. And I then worked out the logic, realized I was wrong. That isn't what goes on. The the um, so the, the 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 way that the treasury creates money in our accounts is by running a deficit, by spending more than it gets back in taxation. That increases the net worth of uh, the public, the private sector, because they've been they've been paid more money into their accounts by government spending than has been taken out in taxation. Most most people don't realise that. They think they're always being the government's always taking. But if the government's spending more than it's getting back in taxation, then in the aggregate, it's injecting money into the economy. Right. Now, when that money turns up, the people who receive that money, the, in the net the net difference between you know, spending versus taxation, if you're spending up here, taxation down here, that net difference is something which increases your deposit accounts right. without being offset by, uh, a, which is your asset without being offset by another liability. So the only way you can record that is an increase in your net worth. Now, that is virtually the opposite of what people think. They think, oh, the government's, you know, spent more than it's got back taxation. They had to borrow that from me in the first place. So the government's now in debt and they've got to pay. And this is what the Taleb came out and said. And that's why I jumped in and said, listen, mate, you do the accounting before you uh, start pontificating on these issues. <laughs> and that wasn't just an admonition to him. It was an admonition to me because I didn't understand it properly until I did the full accounting. And that only happened when I invented a software package that enabled me to do it in the first place.
Yeah, so we're. I think we're saying the exact same thing. Uh, I'm just yeah. saying that the aggregate balance sheet of society increases. Expands. Expands, yeah. yeah, because now that person that received that check from Janet Yellen has more in their bank account, therefore they have more assets. And the yeah, person- without, without being offset by liabilities. Th that's right. That's right. Uh, um, uh, and then the person that, that had the savings to begin with now has a treasury. So yeah, their, their yeah. balance sheet didn't change at all. It's just you, you, you increase the balance sheet of the person that, uh, that received the, the payment, let's say from the TGA or from, from Janet Yellen. Do you think that is something that could explain the consumer price inflation that we, or, or, or that was, I know there's several variables, but do you think that might have been one variable that resulted in consumer price inflation in 2021 and 2022 yeah. is that the government took effectively zero velocity money in the form of savings and turned it into higher velocity money in the form of checking? You see what Slightly I'm saying? Because less, the savings account. That, but yeah, go ahead. Yeah, but I, mean, I, I was, I've, I'm getting. I mean, I'm writing, working on so many things. I, I, I wish I had three or four clones to do the work that I want to do. But one thing that occurred to me this morning, I want to take a copy of the National Rifle Association poster. You know, guns don't kill people. People kill people. And I yeah. want to crash out the guns and say, money doesn't create inflation. People create inflation. Oh, huh, okay. Money enables that inflation to occur. So okay. if you take a look at what happened in 2020, and we, we had a dramatic increase in, in, in net government spending. The deficit went from of the order of 5% of GDP to 15%. And yeah. it had to do that because if we didn't, we would have had bankruptcies everywhere. Okay, People might say they did too much, but if they did nothing, people couldn't have paid their rent, they couldn't have paid their mortgage. You would have had banks going ass up. It would have been a disaster. So they may have done too much of it, but they had to do some of it because when you had a, a shutdown like that, people can't work. Whole industries can't make any money. If you let the financial consequences of that work its way through, we would have had a total financial breakdown. So the government had to spend some money to stop that happening, which it did. Now you look at the scale, they spent about 15% of GDP. And that's of the order of the amount of money that was spent during the Second World War. Right. The deficit hit of that order. And again, without that deficit, we would have, you know, you and I'd be now speaking German or Japanese. Have you heard, have you seen Man in the High Castle, by the way? No, highly recommended movie, except for the last uh, docu um, TV series, except for the last uh, last of the six. The sixth series was dreadful, but that's where the Japanese and the Germans won the Second World War. Anyway, I, I digress. But if we hadn't had that level of spending, we would have lost. OK, the reason that we America and the allies won the Second World War was the sheer scale of manufacturing of liberty ships and guns and tanks and everything else that overwhelmed the Germans. Okay? And that was that was financed by government deficit spending. So I want to put that in back of people's minds because I think there's too much of it. You needed it back in the Second World War. You needed it during the um, the pandemic as well. But that's, that's the thing. There was an increase in the money supply, quite dramatic, and it was... Uh, you know, M, M1 rather than M0, but it was government money creation injected into people's bank accounts. Now, what that meant was you suddenly had a whole lot of industries you couldn't spend money on because nobody was flying, because you couldn't fly, and nobody, nobody was, I can't remember, oh, <laughs> wrong shirt. Um, nobody was, uh, you know, you, going to restaurants, et cetera, et cetera. But you were spending lots of other stuff. What that meant was retailers and manufacturers were suddenly seeing goods rushing out the door that were previously, you know, a, a bit lethargic in sales. And that reduced the perception of competition, which meant, oh, I put my markup up. Okay. So this is what uh, Isabella Weber talks about is what she calls uh, greedflation. Or I don't think she used that term, but seller, um, seller inflation. So markups increased. At the same time, when the when the pandemic first hit, you had an increase in wages. Very, very, the, the downturn with the very first shock of it, then an increase in wages after that. Then, of course, you had supply chain disruptions caused by the pandemic. Okay? So you put all those three factors and say, which one dominates? Which was the biggest people cause inflation, not money cause inflation? It was manufacturers and markups. They rose more than anything else. 
And then after the pandemic, even though unemployment is now quite low, the rate of change of money wages has been below the rate of inflation. So you, you had two major factors leading to the creation of inflation, increased markups and supply chain difficulties, which reduce the efficiency with which we produce and therefore increase the cost. Right. So and, that, and that's again, increased markups, yeah. basically supply demand imbalance. Yeah. And because, um, I mean, there is excess supply. This is another thing I've been working on in a new book I'm right, I've just finished writing called Rebuilding Economics from the Top Down. Uh, when you look at um, production, production, oh, hang on, I've, got, I've lost my train of thought, so I better, I better, I'm doing too many things. So I better <laughs> no. dive back and get to the <laughs> no next problem. point of conversation. No problem, no problem. Yeah, I, it, it's interesting, the components that made up inflation but yet yeah. inflation almost entirely gets blamed on the increase in m2 money supply like you, and you also look at in it, wages yeah people this is why the governments the feds put up interest rates to fight inflation by reducing wages when wages are rising at below the rate of inflation yeah so on that note steve how do you view inflationary pressures from the standpoint of uh inputs or from a standpoint of money supply. And, and where I'm going with that is because uh -huh. you always hear that, look, if oil goes up to $200 a barrel, then this is gonna create massive consumer price inflation because oil, either directly or indirectly, is an input for every single thing that we buy. I struggle with that, because, especially long-term, because I look at it more from a standpoint of a monetarist in that, okay, let's just say that oil goes up by 200 a barrel. Demand for oil, relatively inelastic in our current economy. And if the money supply is not going up, then at a certain point, people are gonna have to buy that gas. And therefore, they're not going to be able to buy something else. So they're kind of robbing That's, Peter to pay Paul. And that, I would argue that if it goes up to 200 a barrel, maybe short term, that increases prices, but long term, that would actually be deflationary. It, and I think wages, I, I would have that same argument. What, what, what do you, how do you view that? Okay. Um, this is a hard one to express in a way that'll get through people's minds, but the money supply is elastic. Okay. Right. You are, if you are effectively seeming it's fairly rigid. Now that's Milton Friedman's argument. You've got money times velocity equals prices times turnover. Okay classic monetary. And he then spent his whole career, not his whole career, he did a lot of other stupid things as well. But he tried to believe velocity was constant. Right. So velocity didn't change. And money was only under the control of the government. He didn't consider private money creation. Uh, and so if you had an increase in the money supply with velocity fixed, you had to have inflation coming out of that. And price, prices would have to rise. Um, and that empirically shot through with holes, even by his own side. Uh, Kittleton and Prescott, who were the most conservative economists on the planet, proved that velocity is highly volatile. And of course, the other side, my side, says, look, the money supply is, is flexible. So if you imagine oil goes up from $100 to $200 a barrel, and you're a major corporation, which either used to have lines of credit, the banks have stopped offering them, unfortunately, but fundamentally lines of credit, or you issue, uh, these days you issue commercial paper. You, back in the days when they had lines of credit, that was like a credit card. So you had, you know, you had a, you know, if you had a, a, a billion dollar line of credit and you had a hundred million of access and suddenly oil goes up uh, and so you've got to pay more for have the oil, you've got to buy the oil to continue your operations. Right. You pay more for the oil, the money supply increases. Oh, okay. So the causation goes from prices to the money supply, not the other way around. And what if, what if, what if risk increases substantially though? That's, that's well, the, risk, the variable, risk, right? Risk means uncertainty and uncertainty about the future. If you get more uncertain, you're going to probably try to invest less. Uh, so you're going to hit your investments, but not necessarily your purchases. You will pass that price on. Okay. And the, when you pass the price on, then, you know, if I've got to go to the um, uh, credit card to pay for my petrol, where previously I had enough cash to pay, then I swipe my credit card. That pays for the oil. It also increases the money supply. Right. So the money supply is much more flexible than people think about it being. And therefore, the the price, you, you're, you were talking about the money supply constraining inflation. 
I'm saying the inflation will cause the money supply to grow. To go up. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I totally understand your view. I, what, when I look at banking or what constrains bank lending, I start from the standpoint of risk because I believe that right or wrong, that regardless, even regardless of regulation, if a bank sees an opportunity to make money, they're, mm -hmm. they're going to figure out how to make that loan. Like, <laughs> oh yeah, that, that, that's that's the bottom line. You, you can throw Basil in there. You could throw SLR. You could throw reserve requirements. Whatever you want to throw at them. If there's a way to make money, they're going to pull the trigger on that. And um, therefore, uh, it's it's kind of a risk reward type of equation for the banks in creating credit or creating money. And so, if risk goes way way up, then all else being equal, I I would expect the the banks to tighten their belts, lend less. Therefore, you've got more loans being paid off. And in that case, you know, money supply could flatten out or even go down. And so, so that's kind of the lens that I look at uh, $200 a barrel oil. But what I obviously didn't do there is, is consider the fact that people would need to borrow more. So mm. the, the, the demand goes up. But the, I guess the question is, does the supply go up? And I guess that goes back to how much risk is in the system. Yeah, well, if the best, that's a, that was a very good example to choose. And have you ever had Richard Vague on your show, by the way? No. You should. Richard uh, is an ex-banker, uh, highly successful. And the way he made his, got established in banking was he was working, running the consumer division of a Texas bank uh, back in the 70s. And during the 79 bubble, when oil went from $10 a barrel to 40, so we're talking precisely your example, rather than causing investment to collapse, that was everybody saw oh, there's money to be made in oil. So all the banks in Texas were lending to anybody who said, I had a hole in the ground with a drill in it, mm. and this black stuff comes out. Okay. So there was, and that's the back to the greed and the risk and reward stuff. All these Texas bankers saw money to be made in oil. They all poured into oil, pardon the pun. And, and, and a dramatic expansion, then oil prices fell from 40 to 10. So it's the opposite of the situation you're talking about. Suddenly, all those banks that lent enormous amounts to oil dr dr drillers were going bankrupt because they were losing, you know, they were, they, all the expectation of pricing in 40 bucks a barrel, it was now 10. And so in that situation, the banks were selling off their profitable division to try to cover their debts. Richard managed to buy the division he worked for, leverage buyout turned it around, which is very rare, and became very, very successful as a banker. Now, mm. that's his backstory. He then, uh, went because he was focused on consumer debt, when the financial crisis was approaching, he was seeing this huge explosion in mortgage debt. I just couldn't understand how people were going to finance it. So he became a skeptic about the financial bubble and managed to sell his bank to Barclays not long before the crash. Okay. So he's a fascinating personal story, but he's also become a major researcher uh, into the volatility caused by banking. And he has gone through and shown that the, the factors you're talking about, the fact that bankers will rush into a bubble and then and so you, that amplifies the bubble because suddenly there's this much more money to, to, to drill the holes for the wells. Mm -hmm. So you get an explosion in oil supply, which my God, it caused oil prices to fall. Okay. And then they all rush out of that. So you get this panic uh, herding mentality by banks, which causes a major part of the volatility that people blame on the government. You know, what's funny, Steve, is I retired in 2012. I, I don't know if we've discussed that uh, before. And when I did, I, I knew nothing about investing. Absolutely zero. I didn't know what the Fed was. I, I barely knew what interest rates were. I, I was just a good entrepreneur. And when I retired, I'm like, I want to manage my own money here. So I just want to buy low and sell high. And at the time, what was low was real estate in the United States. Uh -huh. So I went out and bought all these properties, let's say 20 properties in good neighborhoods, by the way, yeah. uh, with cash, no leverage whatsoever. And I fixed uh -huh. them up. I put a renter in there. And so I had all my properties rented out. I have 100% equity. And this is a time, as, as you probably remember, when the real estate market was at its bottom. From there, it yeah. went just boom, just straight up. And I went, and now fast forward to 2013, I went to bank after bank after bank after bank. And this is with 0% interest rates, by the way. They would not lend to you. They wouldn't lend to me. And, yeah. and I thought, isn't this ironic 
that yeah. the, the best time to possibly buy a house and at the time where there's the least amount of risk uh, to lend on a house, because all you got is upside if you look at yeah. the historical prices adjusted for inflation. And then you got this guy with a 780 credit score, <laughs> like the perfect borrower, and money's tight. Uh, the the yep. interest rate might as well have been in, in, infinite. Yep. Uh, and, and so I think that's such, but now when the real estate market, even adjusted for inflation, is way higher than it was in 2006. Banks are lending left and right and left and right. They, they can't, uh, you know, they jump at anyone that uh, it's almost like 2006 where anyone with a pulse are sitting there throwing money at them at, again, what I would argue is the exact wrong time. Exactly. And this, this is why the banking sector causes so much volatility in, in, in society. And what Richard has done as a researcher now, not as a banker anymore, he's got his research staff to go back and look at not just the academic papers, he's gone back to newspapers, bond release data, really very incredibly detailed research, more than any academic can afford to do. And he's shown that there, over the last one and a half centuries, around the, I think the world's seven major economies, there have been about 150 financial crises across one and a half centuries. Every last one was caused by a lending bubble, bursting. So this is the, the 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 banking sector will amplify instability. It'll lend when it shouldn't and not lend when it should. It's not a stabilizing force in the economy. It's a destabilizing force. And so what is a better system in your view? You have to you have to lend you have to restrict what banks can lend for because again people I mean bankers themselves think they're the masters of the universe. We had enough time of that experience with people in 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 uh, mainly in, uh, in the city of London, of course. Um, but they fundamentally, they create money because they have a license that the state gives them that says they can lend money. And when you can lend money, you can create it. They, most they, This is why the mistake of thinking that they're warehouses. It's yeah. People have this vision that banks are, they run a warehouse and you stock the money in and they lend it to people. And of course, if you lend it to somebody who doesn't lend it back, then you're going to lose money yourself. So you've got to be very cautious, conservative and responsible. If you can create the bloody stuff, you're a factory, okay? You're not a warehouse. Right. And then you think, oh, I can make this stuff. And it's and when you when you make a loan to somebody to buy a house, by God, the house price tends to rise because you're lending more money to the next buyer than you lend to the one who bought it before them who's now selling it to them. And you get a what's called a... Amp it's an amplifying feedback on house prices. So house prices start to rise, and lo and behold, more people come and want to borrow money from you because house prices are rising, and you get a Ponzi scheme, a spiral. And that's what they what they tend to do. They end up creating asset bubbles. Now, banks should not be the masters of capitalism. If I can choose one of the world's great critics of capitalism, one uh, one Carl Carl is it Carl Friedrich Marx? I'm thinking of Engels. Karl Marx uh, at one stage said that. Um, talk about centralization. The bankers and parasites that surround them have enormous uh, power, which occasionally lets them take over the manufacturing system. And these parasites should know nothing about the real economy and should have nothing to do with it. He called them the roving cavaliers of credit. And I think that's a wonderful put down of bankers. They should be there to facilitate the industrial and entrepreneurial side of the economy, not determine where money actually goes. So Who I should have that not... power, Steve? Well, they, they they should be they should have the power to lend to the areas where we need money. We don't need money for Ponzi schemes. Okay, you don't need need to lend money to Bernie Madoff. Okay, so you you okay. would so Glass Steagall is something that something like Glass Steagall. I mean, but but more complicated, more more comprehensive. Like, for example, when you look at housing. House prices are driven fundamentally by credit. When you take a look at the data, and I've done this, of yeah, course, yeah. Uh, fundamentally what causes rising house prices is rising levels of mortgage debt. Okay. Now, we don't need more expensive housing. We need more housing, not more expensive housing. We need money for entrepreneurs and working capital for corporations. Uh, we need money for people to buy long-lived consumer items they can't pay in cash for, like cars and obviously houses. So you should see banks as a service sector for the physical economy, not as the masters of the physical economy. And what we've done by letting banks dominate everything is they're now the masters. 
So we have these huge housing bubbles all around the world, which have, you know, end up crashing at various times. You had, you had your crash in 2007. The Fed actually restarted that bubble through quantitative easing, uh, which was, again, the, the Fed's run by economists, therefore they don't know what they're doing, mainstream economists. Um, so we've had a whole series of asset bubbles, booms and busts. We haven't had money being given to the productive sectors of the economy. And if you, the reason it doesn't happen is because for banks, it's much easier to get involved in a bubble than it is to think about which entrepreneur has got a good idea that might actually turn into a successful company or which company has got you know, good management so it deserves working capital. It's these days, it's who's got a house? And then it became who's got a block of land we can say there's a house on. And, and we've, we've let them to get involved in Ponzi schemes. And that's, you know, you know we should regard bankers as servants of the of the industrial side of the economy, not masters. Let so me I would, let me tell you my view yeah. on that, because yeah. from a standpoint of the mechanics of the system, I I, I think we really really see eye to eye. Now, it, it, it people aren't going to be surprised that you and I have different uh, political views, but um, you know the conclusions I come to are uh, pretty much the same as the conclusions you come to, you know, when you're talking about the right. banks lending and just for financial assets, basically, instead of lending right. for productivity and the creation of goods and services. Yeah. Uh, I, I, my starting point is different though. And so if I'm a banker and let's just go back to the GFC and especially if I'm a large bank and I see that the government or the Fed, the central planners, whatever, they're willing to come in and bail me out. And they're also willing to bail out other people in the financial system or the financial economy, but they are not willing to bail out anyone in the real economy. Uh -huh. Then what I'm gonna do moving forward is, uh, I, now I've got a different set of risks and rewards. Uh, what this will do is this will incentivize me to lend strictly into the financial economy because my risk is so much lower. Because I know that if I lend to a massive corporation just to buy back their shares, that uh, my downside is very low because if that corporation has troubles, well, what the government has proven to me in the past is that they'll most likely come in and bail out that corporation. But if I lend a billion dollars into the real economy for entrepreneurs, for um, you know small and mid-sized businesses, well, the, the government has proven that they're not going to bail that guy out. Uh, and therefore, I've got much more downside risk. So the incentives are, from my view, are set up by the central planners for the banks to go ahead and do these activities that we both agree are counterproductive. Yeah, that's been a political development over time. And yeah. it happens all the time because when you look at who, who, who can go and knock on a politician's door and the door opens, it's not you and me, it's the person from the financial sector. So what happens over, over it? But, but if you go back to 1930s, what doors were bankers knocking on then? The doors of Sing Sing. They were being sent to jail for the frauds they committed during the 1920s. So when you let the finance, because it's so easy to, if you can make money, it's really easy to make money. Pardon the pun, okay? But banks make money, they create it. And if they right. create it, we're in a capitalist economy, that gives them an enormous power. They always abuse it. You end up in a crisis of some sort. After the crisis, for a while, the sentiment shifts towards the you know the ordinary people, the you know, the actual physical economy. I'm trying to think of that. Um, what's that classic Christmas movie with uh, Jimmy Stewart? Yeah, yeah. The, uh, the beautiful life. <laughs> it's a beautiful life. A beautiful life. Okay, okay. That was all about giving money for in, in, you know, individuals to have their houses and businesses to operate and so on. That's what happens after a financial crisis. Before it, it's always going to the people who are snorting cocaine or dancing the Charleston. And and so so so, and I presume there are a few doing both. But what what you what you've got is what I call the political financial complex. Okay, so Eisenhower's talked about the military industrial complex. That's still an issue, but I think what's dominated us politically ever since the seventies and to some extent the sixties is the is the financial political complex. And politicians listen to bankers. Bankers are major funders of the politicians. You get, and then when your politician res, retires, they go and work for a bank yeah. or, you know, a non-bank. So you get this, that, that's where the corruption comes from.
Totally agree. And it, it, and it comes out of fundamentally, again, if the governments actually understood how banks create money, then they would not necessarily be as beholden to the banks as they are now. They'd realize that it's, you know, the, the irresponsibility comes out of the fact that we don't understand how banks operate and make money in the first place. My view not the, not is if I'm, we just my view is hmm. if we reduce the size of the federal government and gave that power to the states, then there the banks would have no incentive to try to lobby politicians because the politicians don't have any power. That that's that's kind of the approach that I take there. Yeah, look, I mean, we're going to have to have an argument over that one at some point. Because, <laughs> uh, yeah, so let, let's let's stick with the economic stuff because that's probably uh, more productive. So mm -hmm. get, getting getting back to that, Steve, over what I think is uh, the, the, the fundamental question here, and that's, uh, or the fundamental narrative that we should address, and that's the U.S. debt crisis. Because, the, and uh, you know the, the story and how this goes, but just for the viewers, the argument is the United States now at $34 trillion in debt. I mean, even you pointed out that during uh, COVID, the, uh, um, the, the debt went to, what, 15% of, uh, as far as the deficit to GDP? Yeah, the, the government debt went to... Uh, Credit was the deficit was fifteen percent of GDP. Right, and, right. So I mean, yeah, we're running yeah, like yeah. wartime deficits, and supposedly uh, we've got a booming economy. So what happens, for heaven's sakes, if we go into a recession? I mean, does the uh, deficit to GDP does it go up to twenty, twenty five percent? I mean, where does this go? And then the question is, okay, well, Janet Yellen's going to have to issue all this additional supply. Therefore, uh, we have a supply demand imbalance. Therefore, interest rates go up. That means that the interest payments on the debt are going up for two reasons, because interest is going up and the overall debt is going up. And you go into this doom loop where there's just no demand. Interest rates keep going up and you have effectively a debt crisis. So um, that's the narrative. Yeah. How do you do you agree with that? Do you disagree no. and why? Okay, this this is why I had that little fight with um, with Chaleb, right? Because I said it's why you've got to do the accounting, and if you spout off about these things without understanding the accounting, you're going to spout off and make assumptions about how, what debt actually is that are wrong. Because if you and I get into this, and that's what you know, private sector debt is by far the most dangerous thing in capitalism, not government debt. So if you look at what happens with the government, it's, it's, I'll go through the steps. Actually, it'd be better if I tried to show you my Minsky software. Yeah, we've got Josh on here. Bear with me one moment, Steve. Can Josh, yeah. can Steve do a screen share? If Josh can hear me there. Deep down? Oh yep, you're, you're all good to share your screen. Okay, so Steve, what you do is there should be a button. That Does he have to do that, Josh, or did you set that up for him? It's got present as an option. It would just be a present at the okay. bottom. Okay. Yeah, it's down the bottom. I won't, I won't bring it up right now because I need to get slightly prepared for it, which I can do if we if you have a, a bit of a spiel, I'll go through and do it. But the point I wanted to make is if you if you lay out the accounting, and I can do this live, actually. I can show it up on, on the Minsky software. Uh, government debt is not debt. Okay. The government does not borrow from the, from the private sector. The government sells bonds. Right. To the non to the banking sector and to primary dealers. Okay. Yep. How do the primary dealers and banks finance the purchase of those bonds? They finance it by using the reserves, which we call them reserves, they're probably better called settlement account uh, funds, settlement funds that have been created by the deficit in the first place. So if you have a bank, if you have the government that runs a deficit of ten percent of GDP. Uh, then that increases deposit accounts by 10% of GDP. It also increases bank reserves by 10% of GDP. Now, if I go back to pre-financial crisis days, because it makes it clearer, before the financial crisis, banks weren't paid interest on their reserves. Okay, So you had a, the banks, by the government running a deficit of 10% of GDP, banks had an asset grow by 10% of GDP that was a zero return asset. So what the Treasury would then do, and there's reasons to why it does this, it would then offer bonds for sale, okay, to the, and the only people who can buy the bonds initially from the Treasury are either banks, which have accounts at the Federal Reserve, or primary dealers, which have accounts at the Federal Reserve. 
So they then get an offer. Would you like to buy bonds equivalent to 10% of GDP? Uh, and we're going to say give you a 3% yield on those bonds. Okay. But you've got reserves worth 10% of GDP giving you zero. Somebody offers you to sell, give you bonds, which are going to give you 3%. Do you turn it down or do you take the offer? Well, first of all, what I'm thinking about, even maybe before we get to that question, is yeah. the, the reserves were flat from 1980 to 2007, and they barely went up. If you can go back Ex to 1950, Ex excess reserves, yeah, yeah. No, 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 reserves, not excess. Okay, okay, just, just okay. reserves. Uh, mm -hmm. So I, I'm not sure how they're going through this this process. Uh, also. The way I understand well, that, it. If I can just quickly interject and yeah, say why. Ahead. Because as, as soon as the reserves were created, the bonds were sold. Okay. Reserves the... get turned into... When, when the government creates reserves by running a deficit, and it, like it's, when, talking, when I'm talking about a deficit, I'm, I'm talking like the annual level of being 10% of GDP. But if you look at the financial operations the government goes through to finance its spending, it's required by law, not by the physical... Um, monetary system, but by laws passed by politicians to say that you must cover sell bonds equivalent to the deficit, and you need to look out of over a whole year of spending. So you're having you know weekly or even more frequent bond sales. As right. soon as the reserve, when the reserves are created, at the same time they're sold into bonds again. So the reason reserves don't change fundamentally is that they're being converted into bonds all the way through. You only have the dramatic increase in reserves under Ben Ben Bernanke, or as I prefer Ben Bewanke. I prefer to mispronounce his name. Yeah. Um, uh, because he thought that would encourage lending because he th doesn't understand the monetary system. So the reserves were trivial because they were being converted on, on a weekly or even more rapid basis from being reserves into being bonds by that bond sale process. So they're basically recycling the the reserves that they had yeah. very, very, very quickly. Yeah. So there didn't need to be any more reserves to buy those, the, the amount of treasuries. That's right. And like okay. if, if there, if there wasn't sufficient reserves to buy an amount of, of, um, of bonds on offer at any point in time, then all the, to, to enable that all the fed had to do is to buy some existing bonds off the banks or the non-bank financial institutions and by buying the bonds off the banks it then converted bonds back into reserves again right. which meant whatever the current deficit spending had to be financed by my god those bonds sold isn't that amazing the, so the, the whole the idea that, basically liquidity to buy those bonds or buy yeah, those treasuries yeah yeah so it's a it's a managed system and managed very well and understood very badly Okay, so um, I, let me try to unpack this just for the, the viewers here. So okay. Janet Yellen sells a, a treasury, we'll just say for $1,000 or something like that. Uh, oh. Basically, we'll, we'll just call it a primary deal, we'll just call it a banking entity just for the sake of uh, yep. keep things simple. Uh, they're going to go ahead and use reserves for that. And then what they're going to do is they're going to, so, so those reserves go down into the TGA and then the TGA uh, spends that money back in. So that creates a, a, a commercial bank deposit liability, uh, but then those reserves go right back into the banking system, uh, which allows them to buy another treasury uh, if, yep. if they so choose. Uh, so there's always, in, in your view, there, there's always uh, quote unquote money there to buy the amount of treasuries. That, that's, that's never an issue. Um, because the bank controls that through the amount of reserves in the system. And even if, let's just, the way I view that that auction system, Steve, and maybe I've got this wrong, is you've got the, the primary dealers there to buy if there's not enough demand from the non-bank entities who are there uh, bidding for those uh, treasuries at a certain price. Uh, yeah, and, I mean, and, or the banks. Yeah, I mean, that's that's what I is, is it worth going and doing trying to do a live layout now because I'm ready to roll. Yeah, um, look, can you, uh, Josh? Can you help Steve pull that up? I'll just actually go. I've got it ready here, so I'll just actually. Can you I'll do a screen share? Up in a second. Here we go. So present and uh, share screen and entire screen, and that's what I'm going to share. So can you see four bank icons? Hold on a second uh, here. I can't see anything yet, Josh. Do you want to change the the view? Uh, it should be up. It should be up now. There we go. Okay. So I'll just actually make them a bit bigger. 
So I'm going to title this one, uh, this is the, the banks, just going to type the names in here. So this is the banks. And this one's going to be the uh, non-bank, the private sector. So, so private non-banks. Okay. And then you have the uh, the Fed. You always make typing mistakes when doing this stuff, unfortunately. And then we're going to have Treasury. And this is why I say, if you don't do the accounting, you can't understand what the hell's going on. Totally agree. Why I invented, invented this program in the first place. Let's now put the banks in what's called editor mode. I'll just actually bring up the window. So what, what Minsky does is it enables you to see uh, everything in terms of assets minus liabilities mm -hmm. minus equity. So that's keeping mm -hmm. a track on on right. what uh, you know what the financial commitments are and so on. And I'll just put them all. I'm putting them all in editor mode now. It just makes it easy to see what's going on. So let's bring up the the banking table here, and I'll make that large scale so people can see what's going on. So the first thing I'm going to call them reserves because this is what you know uh, people think banks lend out of. We're going to have bonds, which are owned by the banks, and then loans that they make to the private sector, and then they're going to have deposits, which are, you know, you and the assets you and I have at the uh, at the banking sector, and then just call this banks underscore e for equity. So right. if you imagine, let's say that uh, you have a deficit, so spending minus taxation by the government. I'm not going to call that deficit. So if you say, well, that's going to be an amount of money which is put into deposit accounts. You, know, you, you spend more than your tax, then that's deficit dollars per year turns up in your bank in your bank accounts. Now, how do you notice as Minsky's keeping track over here and saying, well, assets minus liabilities minus equity must equal zero. So you've got to put another entry that makes that zero. And right. the only sensible place to put it is reserves go up. Okay. So that's a deficit. Okay. And that's the sort of thing I'm going to go through and continue uh, doing through the whole system. So there's a deficit turning up for the banks. Right. But, but let's just yeah. before we move on, Steve, um, yeah. is, it, is it possible there that you had a reduction in the liabilities before you had the increase and therefore you didn't need the additional assets? So what I'm saying there, just giving you a, a kind of a, a real world uh, example is if you've got money in M2, if you've got money in M2, that's basically a liability of the commercial bank. And therefore, if uh, that M2 is used to buy the treasury, let's just assume that the non-bank entities can bid at auction. Uh, then what's going to happen is the amount of liabilities on the bank's balance sheet is going to go down because they're taking that account balance, let's say from a thousand. Yeah, but that's that. That's three or four stages further on. I haven't even got to bond oh, I'm sorry. sales yet. I'm sorry. Okay. okay. So, sorry. Yeah. okay. So what, what I've got to do is say, well, uh, let's bring up the private sector and see what it looks like from their point of view at the moment. And this is this is why, hang on, pardon me. Uh, you've now got the private sector and there's a, the bank has had a liability which has been created, uh, which is deposits. So the deposits have added to the assets of the non-bank sector. And the only way I can balance it is called this private equity, the private sector equity, because uh, there's no there's no offsetting liability. Right. So the deficit has increased the size, the, the net worth of the non-bank sector. Yeah. So now the deficits increase your private equity. Yeah. What actually happens when we look now at the at the Fed here, because now take a look at the Fed situation, then the Fed reserves are a liability for the Fed. Okay, so they've now got a negative there. So where does it come from? What you find is there's the you use the term TGA, don't you? Yeah. Okay, that's TGA, which is of course is owned by the Treasury. So the deficit comes out of the TGA, which balances the Fed's books at this stage. Mm -hmm. so what happens to the Treasury? Let's bring up the Treasury. And because the TGA is an asset for the treasury, so the deficit 
has in, has reduced the equity of the treasury. It's gone down. How do you balance it? There are no liabilities to be allocated that way because bonds, uh, or the, I've got bonds owned by the banks, but I, actually I, I've typed it in already. So that's that's is a liability of the of the treasury. Mm -hmm. uh, but the equity, I'm not going to say the bonds go down. What actually happens to treasury? Equity goes down. So I now I've got to type minus deficit inside here. And having done that, I've now got the absolute basics of the system. And what you can see is the private sector, the deficit, you see it's in black there, your money's gone up. The equity of the private sector has increased because right. the equity of the treasury has gone negative. Right. And it's right. been passed through the banking sector and passed through the feds. Okay? Right. That's the absolute basics. And at that point, that's why uh, you, you know, if you don't understand that, then you're going to think, um, you know, the government's got to borrow money from somewhere. No, it, it goes into negative equity. Now, that's not negative equity in terms of you know, buildings being worth negative amounts of money and having a negative army and uh, a negative police force and et cetera, et cetera. It's financial obligations. So the sum of all financial uh, equities is zero. Okay. So if the government's in negative equity, we're in positive equity. Now, the alternative, if you want the government to be in positive equity, you want to be in negative equity. You want to owe the government money. That's not a very good idea, okay? So the government is the only entity in society which can sustain negative financial equity towards the rest of the system. And if you don't have that in your head, then you're going to come up like Taleb and other people do and, and panic about it. Now, I, I can continue on from this point and elaborate bond sales and everything else and, and so on but nothing changed the basic idea that the the, de the deficit is created uh the deficit creates negative equity to the government which is positive equity for us yeah i think it, this goes back to what we were saying at the beginning and just the way i phrase that is it increases the aggregate balance sheet or the assets on the aggregate balance sheet of the of, of the non-government entities Right. Yeah. And, and therefore, yeah. I guess you, you would argue that, look, if this is increasing the assets on the, the, the balance sheet of the, the non-bank entities, they're going to have the let's just call it liquidity to buy more treasuries, uh, assuming the government wants to run more deficits. And then those higher deficits are just going to increase the uh, non-government equity even more. Yeah. Yeah. And there's a question of when you, that this this is why it's so like, you know, if you would have heard of modern monetary theory, obviously, sure, of this this what I'm doing is supports modern monetary theory as a as a technical explanation of how governments create money. Um, but it gives a different flavor to it because they haven't developed anything like Minsky. I'm trying to get them to use it. The people who are the main advocates, some of them are, uh, but it's it's very slow. Because uh, there's a bit of you know not invented here resistance from some people, um, but the basic like, orientation that I get is it comes down to the question of net equity and financial equity. So if you then if you, if your financial asset is somebody else's financial liability, right. so the sum of all financial equities is necessarily zero. Then you look at the banking sector. The bank, by definition, must have positive equity. Okay. It must have short-term assets which are greater than the short-term liabilities. Otherwise, it's literally bankrupt. Okay, so the banking sector must be in positive equity. Now, if you don't have the government in the, if you talk about a pure credit economy, which of course I've modelled, uh, a pure credit economy, because the banking sector is in positive equity, necessarily the non-bank private sector, and you only have a private sector in this model, must be in negative equity. Now. Nobody likes being in negative equity. This is the, the hot potato story. Nobody likes being in negative equity. So if we're in negative equity, what it tends to mean is we think, oh, how can I get the positive equity? I know I'll borrow some money from the bank and I'll use that to gamble on asset prices because now we're talking about non-financial assets, shares, houses, and a house is your asset and nobody else's liability. That's a non-financial asset. Okay. Now, if the value of the house goes up, because you've borrowed money to buy a house and that's caused the general price level to rise. You do your sum say, oh, I'm in positive equity now, but you're caught in a Ponzi scheme. Okay. And that's that's why it's so important to think about the equity issue. Now, if the government comes in, and we've got the government here, obviously, uh, the government can go into negative equity. And if it's in sufficiently large negative equity, then both the banking sector and the non-bank financial private sector can be in positive equity. 
And that means we panic less. And if you go back and look in the 50s and 60s, which is the time when you had a large government sector before the Second World War and the Great Depression, there was the government sector was like 5% of GDP rather than 30. So its contribution was almost not there. You almost had a, a pure private sector at that time. Uh, you, when, during the 50s and 60s, government running about 30% of GDP, running deficits, everybody was in positive equity. Nobody was worried about being a negative equity. We didn't have financial bubbles. Okay? The financial bubbles came along over time as the level of private debt rose. And that's, I think I've got that actually showing because people are always fetishizing about the level of, of government debt. They don't consider the level of private debt. And from my analysis, that's by far the most important one. That's private debt. Um, Josh, can you put that up there? I don't. So Just private debt, is it right. there now? Yeah, okay. yeah. Private debt began at 50% of GDP back after the Second World War. It was way up here beforehand during the Great Depression. It then rose. There's the 80s bubble and burst. There's the financial crisis, bubble and burst. There's the impact of COVID. In fact, there was a burst, a burst to credit at that point. And down here's credit as a rate of change of private debt as a percentage of GDP. And there was, I'll just I'll focus on 1984 just to have show the financial crisis in more deliberate detail, but for the whole of the post-war period, we've been borrowing more money from banks and increasing our private debt levels. And we got to credit being plus 15% of GDP up about here. And then you have the crash into the financial crisis. That's what caused the crisis. So while we're obsessing about government debt, nobody's taking this apart from me and Richard Vague and a few others are taking a serious look at private debt. And that's the real problem. So you would prefer a system where the uh, if if the if one of the balance sheets was increasing as far as level of debt, you would prefer that it was the government, not the private sector. Yeah, up to a certain point. I mean, uh, but but if you look in the fifties and sixties, government debt was actually very high after the Second World War, but it fell yeah. not because the government was paying debt off, but because the economy was growing, but also because we were borrowing more and more money from private banks. Now. A certain amount of private debt is is important because you want to have firms getting working capital. You want entrepreneurs to get money. You want consumers to be able to borrow money to buy a house and stuff like that. Something of the order of 50 to 75% of GDP is not dangerous. But when you get to 150 and 170%, and in Japan's case, 230%, when the peak of its bubble, then you've got a crisis on your hands because that's almost always driven by a Ponzi scheme, whether that's about buying uh, houses and speculating on house prices or whether buying shares. And we let the private sector get out of control in doing that stuff. That's when we have a crash. And then in the aftermath, that's when government debt tends to rise again because the government comes in and bails out the banks. In your view, how high can government spending to GDP get, as far as a percentage of GDP, before it becomes counterproductive? Depends on your but, circumstances, obviously. The second yeah, we can't go to 100%, down. right? If, if the government is 100% of, of GDP, then that's most likely not gonna be an efficient economy. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you, you need a balance between the private and public sectors. And this is, like, I, what I find really, again, another frustrating thing about how economists have framed everything. If you do an economics degree, equilibrium is where the supply and demand curves cross, okay? And if anything comes in like government or trade unions that disturb that equilibrium, therefore it's bad. And that's basically, you know, private sector 100% really good, any government bad. You get the other extreme with named Marxists, what I call cardboard cutout Marxists anyway, People who believe in the labor theory of value, any any private sector bad. Okay? There's a balance. Okay? The government is best at things which don't require a free monthly return. Okay? The government is things where you want long term uh, uh, facilities, you want education, you want roads, you want dams, all that sort of stuff. You want sewerage works. Uh, that's the sort of thing where the government having a long-term perspective, you want those assets maintained for the long term. That's where the government makes sense. Private sector, you want to be coming up with planes, rockets, et cetera, et cetera. Goods and software. services. Yeah. And, then, and so there's a divide between the two. And if you go all for the private sector, you end up with bubbles and Ponzi schemes and catastrophes and long-term assets. You go all for the government, you get stagnation.
Okay, so there's definitely a balance. Um, I think it's above the level that America is at. Uh, maybe I, th I think, as always, the Scandinavian countries seem to be high levels of of government spending, but as but about as high as they can go and and be sustainable. That's sort of the order of forty or forty percent of GDP these days. Because you look at the long term assets, like Germany, as much as it's crazy about trying to reduce government debt, education is free there. Nobody walks out with a a, a, um, a student loan because the, the education is free. And that means the students don't worry about raising money from part-time jobs so they can pay their student bill. They're studying. If they don't study hard enough, they fail. Uh, that's the situation I prefer as an academic. Uh, Unfortunately, so, Steve, sometimes you get what you pay for, buddy. No, you get much better <laughs> education. Forget it, mate. Sorry. <laughs> American education sucks compared to what I've seen in Europe. No, but uh, I, I, my view on that is it has more to do with the culture because I've actually compared uh, like per spending per student, like in South Korea, as an example, yeah. uh, compared mm. to the United States. And you're right. Like, like South Korea spends way less, way less per student, but their results are, you know, uh, 10 times better. Uh, but yeah, I, because, I, I yeah. see that as a, as a cultural issue. But anyway, no, anyway. It, 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 but the, the culture comes out of the uh, uh, again, like the European uh, the, the Asians in particular worry about education. You know, um, they, they just think it's an absolute necessity to have an educated population, and yeah. therefore you don't have you don't have to market universities. You don't have all these bloody vice chancellors paying themselves a fortune because they're the god that's going to. You know, I've, I've been through all that shit. Believe me, I've hated it. Uh, <laughs> universities have been turned into marketing centres. They all spend more money on marketing than they do on education. Yeah, right. So you know, we've got the worst of both worlds out of privatising education. Yeah, Steve, this has been a fascinating conversation. I, I really, you know, as we're going through this, if I can just be honest with you, I'm just thinking to my, while I'm, I'm doing my best to follow what you're, you're saying and, you know, uh, in, insert certain, uh, uh, points here and there, I'm just thinking to myself how lucky I am to be able to sit <laughs> here seriously. And, and I don't know where you, I think you're in Europe somewhere. I'm sitting here in Medellin, Colombia. Yeah. And the mm -hmm. fact that I can talk to someone, uh, that has the types of insights that you have and and use that to uh, improve my my thinking is just uh, it's it's really a blessing. So and I'm sure that every single person that watches this video uh, will feel the exact same way, regardless of whether they uh, agree or disagree with your uh, proposed uh, you know solutions. So uh, again, I sure appreciate your time. For anyone that wants to learn about uh, what you do with your software which is, I, I can't even, another thing that I was thinking is how can more people not be using this? Like, like when you were saying that the MMT types aren't using your software, you know, I'm thinking about all my whiteboard videos and pretty much uh -huh. every single whiteboard video I, I, I do, I use just these T balance sheets of, of assets yeah. and liabilities. I don't understand how that other people in your profession are not using your software or using something similar. So it, for people that want to access that incredible knowledge and those insights you have, where can they go to do that? Okay, well, look, actually, I'll, I think I'll put a link in here, first of all, because Ninsky is open source, um, so you can just download it for free. Uh, but, from, the, but I'm trying to drive know. people to your Patreon, Steve. we got to get people to your Patreon, I'll do that as buddy. Well. I'll do that as well. <laughs> okay. okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, but, but, <laughs> I'm a bit dumb. I'm an academic. Okay, yeah, thank you. <laughs> I have, I'm, I'm now a self-supported academic. I left the university sector, great pleasure in 2018. It's, it's, it sucks so badly. So it's now Patreon, which, and thank you, Rebel Capitalist, uh, patreon.com slash Prof Steve Keen. And there's also a Substack page. Uh, on Patreon, uh, you can support me as little as $1 a month or $10 a year. That's the cheapest there. Substack is $5 a month or 120 a year. But in both cases, because my supporters... I polled them very early on, uh, said, look, we'd prefer if you made the stuff freely available rather than being restricted. So you can get my stuff there for free as well. Of course, I would prefer to be supported, uh, but mm. I've also got the emphasis that I want to get the ideas out there because I'm I'm so sick of the nonsense people believe right. uh, about a whole range of issues. And economists have been, if capitalism ever collapses, it won't be the Marxists that bring it down, it'll be the neoclassical economists. So mm. I'm trying to save capitalism. People think they're the greatest 
it's their greatest fans. So Patreon slash Prof Steve Keen, Substack is Prof Steve Keen dot Substack dot com. And thank you for correcting me on that front, George. Uh, fantastic, Steve. Thanks for your time, buddy. I can't wait to do it again. Beauty and great. Same here.